Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, I actually cannot see uh, how many participants there are at the moment because I'm uh, sharing my screen. Uh, but if you're looking for the uh, De Gruyter digital transformation discussion, you're in the right presentation. So uh, I'd like to get started. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today, and thank you for joining, is how digital transformation works at a mid-sized academic publishing house. And before we go too much further, uh, just introduce myself. My, my name is Brian Bishop. I'm the Vice President for Digital Transformation at De Gruyter. Uh, and previously I've held uh, product positions at uh, other companies such as Secret Escapes and Just Eat. Uh, but I also spent 12 years at Springer in a product management position. And hello everyone. Uh, my name is Scott Williams. I'm the VP for Platform and Technology here at De Gruyter. I've been at De Gruyter for nearly three years. Uh, my background is predominantly um, startups. I worked at Google for a while. Um, I've done a few digital transformations. Um, so I'm three years into the uh, into the industry, so still relatively new. So with that segue of digital transformations, um, before we begin, we thought it might be beneficial for any members of the audience who might not be so familiar you know, with De Gruyter, uh, for us to just review a couple of, of key facts about our company. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to mention that we will be leaving ample time for uh, Q&As at the end of our session. Uh, so we really would like this to be an interactive session so that you get the most you know, out of it uh, possible. And if you'd like to use the question feature of Zoom uh, to kind of precede anything you'd like to ask, uh, there may be an opportunity for us to, to organize that before the, uh, the Q&A section begins. But about De Gruyter, uh, De Gruyter actually began publishing books in 1749. Uh, it was a, a book uh, a store that was granted a, a charter to, to publish books, uh, was then eventually merged with a couple of other publishing imprints by Walter de Gruyter. Uh, we have today around 400 uh, employees and offices all over the world. We publish um, about uh, 15, sorry, 1100 books uh, and 16,000 journal articles a year uh, over our eight imprints. Uh, we are uh, adopters of open access. I think we're one of the largest open access book publishers. Uh, we have around 70 million uh, euros in, in a turnover uh, yearly uh, in 2020. And on degroider.com, we host over 120,000 digitized uh, eBooks and over 800,000 journal articles, along with a number of other database and other digital products. Uh, and it's degroider.com and the, the technology, the content platform that we're gonna be talking about today. Right, okay, thanks Brian. Yeah, so um, my role here uh, at De Gruyter is to, uh, is, is, is to run technology and subsequently the platform. So what we wanted to do is uh, give you a pretty transparent narrative of um, what was our thinking, what was our plan, why did we do the things we do and did and um, what's our approach going forward. So, and as Brian's point, any questions around this, feel free. So. The first thing is, is that to give the, you know, so I joined three years ago and when I turned up, um, it was clear that the platform that we had wasn't doing a good enough job for our stakeholders, customers, users, researchers, the whole, the whole kind of universe. So what we wanted to do was first of all, enable us to uh, have a stable, scaled digital platform that was fast, secure, and secondly, is that we owned it. So if something went wrong, we could fix it. If we wanted to improve, improve something, we could. And I guess, you know, from a strategic perspective, uh, we wanted to look, kind of look at digital first. So look at data, look at digital, look at cloud infrastructures. Um, so that's why we decided to move away from our incumbent kind of supplier. Next one. Sorry, Scott. No worries. So uh, what have we done? What have we done? So first of all, we, uh, as, as of February the 1st this year, we moved away from our long-term partner um, who was effectively an off-the-shelf platform. <coughs> Excuse me. We, um, we partner with 67 Brits. Um, I think the subtext to this is that the majority of work and stuff that we've done, we've partnered with them to do it. Um, we couldn't have done half the stuff 
that we wanted to do without them. Um, the third point is, is that we've also starting to scale our own capabilities and build a new type of culture and um, approach to our work. And like I said before, we need to think digital first, data first, mobile first, all those things. So that's what we've done. So in terms of how do we break that down into kind of components that might be useful for you to kind of think about or ask us questions later about. The first one is that um, my background is kind of startups and data products and infrastructure and brands and all those things. Um, but you don't make a decision unless you know what's going on. So data drives our development. Um, and that means that we basically, because we effectively have a new platform in the cloud, we can monitor down to the millisecond um, the, the, how the platform performs, how it behaves, if it's under attack, if it's slowing down for certain reasons, if we've made a mistake, if we need to change something. We don't do anything unless we have proof that there's a problem. And when we fix that problem, it then improves the situation. So data is at the heart of everything that we do currently at the moment, and that'll be more coming up soon. Thanks, Brian. Um, this is a kind of really, uh, for me, this is really, really, uh, this is a very comfortable place, but uh, clearly um, launching something which isn't perfect and then making it better and better and better every single week is basically the antithesis of how a publisher behaves and acts in the sense that uh, any product that leaves a traditional academic publisher, it needs to be signed off from multiple layers, everyone needs to be happy with it, and it goes out and everyone's super pumped about it how nice and beautiful the book looks and or whatever the product is. With digital, you are you absolutely have to put it live as quickly as possible, manage the risk and then improve on it day in, day out. And it never finishes, it never stops. Our platform was never good enough. It's still pretty amazing, but we're nowhere near where it could be. And so we constantly have to iterate and communicate what we're doing and why. I think as a side point to this is that I'd say at least 50% of the work we do is never seen because it's software and infrastructure. So we, we do a load of work and people don't see a shiny thing and um, that can be a bit of a problem, but yeah, that's uh, that's what we've been doing. And we'll give you the stats on that later. And then, yeah, like I said, it's our own platform. So um, we were able to kind of make changes. We're able to, um, use the, the resources and the partnership with 67 Bricks now to fundamentally change how the business behaves and acts. And technology is um, uh, a key driver in that. And also subsequently then data that comes out of our platform is something we can then use and work out, you know, what's going well, what's not going well, what's being read, what's not being read. The whole thing is up for, up for analysis, which we've just started doing. Thanks, Brian. So where did we start and where did we end up? So this is kind of a very reductive kind of version of, of events. But so uh, in October 2019, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, I worked with 67 Bricks on building a prototype. That prototype basically was all of our OA content in the cloud and with a front end that you could go uh, and search and find all of the OA content to your heart's content. Um, and we told the business that we could build that in six weeks. Uh, I'm not entirely sure anyone actually believed us, um, but we did. And then from there, we proved that um, being agile, being quick, uh, being focused on some core principles enabled us to build things a lot quicker. So from there, we went from an alpha test. That, that was probably nine or 10 months. Just as a, as, a, as a mute point, this was all during COVID as well. Do not do this during a pandemic. It's a very bad idea. <laughs> just, just, just as a, a mute point. Um, so nine, 10 months, we built an alpha, an alpha version, which is basically uh, a version of the platform which we knew wasn't complete. And we gave it to our staff and our staff basically tore it to pieces, found loads of bugs, fixed a load of things. We then released that again to the staff for two weeks. Um, they did the same thing again. We fixed it. We then opened it up to our customers to a certain extent and got some feedback on that. And that basically enabled us to, when it came to, and I remember the time and date very, very clearly, clearly uh, February the 1st uh, at three o'clock um, Central European time, we flipped the switch 
and we were 99.9% .9 sure that everything was going to be fine, and it was. Um, and then from there, subsequently, we basically started monitoring the platform, the data, and week in, week out, continually improving um, the features, the performance, the robustness, um, the access to content that our customers have bought. It's an ongoing process. So that was our that was our approach to building what we what we what we built. Thanks, Brian. So yeah, what have the Reuters built? So. The best way to describe it is, is that most technologies, uh, legacy technologies, are what they call monolithic. So basically, huge big metal boxes where everything that needs to happen is inside the box. So when something goes wrong, you need to take the box apart. And as soon as you take the box apart, uh, it becomes very expensive, very complicated. So what we did uh, with in conjunction with 67 Bricks is build a bunch of uh, things that we know the technology needs to do, but each of them is their own kind of mini service or mini product. And they talk to each other in AWS, uh, Amazon Web Services, and enables us to monitor the performance, but also improve, change a piece of technology and have no dependency on another. Um, so uh, during my time at Google, you get taught that if you put humans and technology together, things fail. So this system enables us for failure to happen and for us to work quickly to fix it. We also built a product data warehouse. So that is basically a centralized automated kind of repository where all our content sits and it feeds our platform, it feeds our partners, partner sites, um, and um, it is able um, to scale and enable us to do a lot more in the future. And plus we kind of work with the likes of obviously 6M Bricks, I've mentioned PSI, and the links who help us with our access and identity management and also Foxy Cart, which is our web shop. So we've built um, a platform and that platform is there for us to do whatever we need to do, but also um, it's also there for us to ensure that the longevity of Deboita is cloud-based, is data-based. Um, and that's this is just the start of that. So that's what we built. So what happened when we did all of that stuff? So this is just a, a brief overview of that. Um, the first one to really talk about um, is really that from the outset, we, we looked at the data and it was clear that, you know, a huge proportion of our traffic came from Google, Google Scholar. So we spent a lot of time whilst we were building the platform and the front end and the applications and the, 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 the services is that we need to make sure that when it goes live, Google finds a lot more of our traffic than it did previously. So uh, I won't, I'm assuming everyone here can see the graphic, but you can see that we have had an exponential growth in kind of our visibility of our content on Google, which is step one. Um, and we are continually um, looking to improve the performance um, as other of these things. It's never, it's a never ending thing, but you can see that this is a, this, this highlights that the work we did, the approach we did absolutely paid off because we've just maxed, we're trying to maximize out our number one um, marketing channel, which is Google and Google Scholar. Thanks, Brian. Um, the other thing to, to highlight is that I think due to the scale of what we were doing, our off the shelf partner started to struggle with kind of their architecture and the speed. So this is page speed. So on the old platform, if you were to kind of type in a URL, it would probably take about 11 seconds for it to render or appear on the browser, um, which, is, which is too slow. Let's just put it that way. Uh, it's now down to kind of around two seconds. And actually, if you were to search on the old platform, I remember correctly, it's kind of like maybe 13, 14 seconds per search. And now it's under a second. So if you want to um, be successful, your website has to be fast. Um, and to be fast, you need architecture. You need architecture, you need a plan, and you need analysis and data to make these things work. So they're all very much codependent. But yeah, so speed was a huge outcome and performance was a huge outcome for our researchers, our customers. Uh, we also have more traffic. So we've had a 25% increase in traffic too, which is fantastic. So um, that is down to some of the planning and, and work that we, we did over the last 18 months to make that happen too. So. And our intention is to try and drive as much traffic to our platform as possible because more eyeballs equals you know happier customers. So 
all good on that front. And I guess the other thing is that uh, we have, so deployments are uh, a bunch of tickets that we have in our project management system that we've grouped together and then pushed live. So we have done 53 uh, deployments to the platform since we went live and I've done the maths and it works out to be about 1.25 a week. So let's just round it up is that we're kind of basically doing one, maybe two deployments per week. Now, some of those are things that people can use and some of those, those are data points, some of those are infrastructure, but the point is, is that we do not ever stop making this thing better. And those numbers are, are in fact, when Brian and I were talking about that, we think that number's actually gone up, but I haven't checked, but I think we did a deployment today, in fact. So the amount of effort we're putting in to make things better is kind of where we're at. So all good. And I guess the other thing is, is then, you know, we also have to then show things um, because people like using things and people like using our website. We've got lots and lots of traffic. Um, so on the left was uh, our initial kind of homepage. Um, and, and in terms of transparency, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a 5 percent product, right? So 5 percent of our traffic roughly comes through the homepage. Um, but because of the because of the work we did previously with the, with the product data warehouse, and the, the infrastructure with 67 bricks, we were able to kind of divvy up um, our, our, our content into data. And then when we're able to data, data, we're able to manipulate it. So we basically made a new kind of homepage, which was all about exploration, giving people the ability to dive into the content or the popular content they want. And this has been super successful. Um, and it's just the start as our, our UX guy is constantly coming up with new ideas for this. Um, but the, I guess the real point is here is that we change things, but also the work we did previously enabled us to do a lot more of this work than, than we've ever had before. Thanks, Brian. So with that uh, quick review about, you know, what it is that we did, you know, the, the approach that we took, uh, and then the outcomes, you know, that, that resulted from it, Scott and I thought that what would really be valuable you know, for this session is for us to try and outline some of the major lessons that we learned you know, going through this. So if anybody else is gonna think about going through this or um, gonna be, make a major investment you know, in changing their digital capabilities, um, what might you, you know, uh, take, take from our uh, uh, experience? The first thing that I think it's, it's great and good news in, in a lot of ways is to really uh, understand that you don't need everything. You really need less than you think. Uh, there are a lot of internal practices that you might be worried about if you're, if you're embarking upon this as a first time experience um, and you wanna you know, make sure that you are tightly controlling the, uh, the outcome of all this investment. Um, there are not really a lot of strict processes that are necessary. There's a lot of ad hoc communication that is necessary and a lot of transparency that's necessary. But um, strict you know, kind of project governance uh, isn't isn't absolutely necessary for uh, for success and in some circumstances might even be counterproductive. Mm -hmm. You don't need all the features that you think you need. Um, you know, when we transferred off of the, the previous platform and also in you know, my previous life at Springer when we engaged in a very similar uh, activity to kind of build our own platform, uh, we launched with far fewer features than were available on the on the sites previously. We took away functionality from our users but because we were providing them with so much additional value in terms of speed, in terms of discoverability, um, the benefits far, far outweighed, you know, the things that were, that were taken away and that were lost. Uh, comprehensive documentation. This one's a, a, a bit of a double-edged sword because there were many times when we really were lacking any documentation about how things worked around the company. And a lot of time and effort had to be spent in, in kind of uncovering those things. So I'm not saying documentation is bad, but it's kind of against the entire agile ethos uh, to try to do too much documentation of what it is you think you need uh, before, you do, before you do any kind of building. And I think the best practice is really to start with the hard things, uh, get them going as quickly as possible and try to create that, the thinnest slice possible of something you can, you can go all the way into a, a final finished product and say, okay, it's just one piece but we've got it working and now we'll expand it, we'll do more, we'll add more, et cetera, next thing, next thing, next thing. So documentation, absolutely, but just enough and just in time. Really?
Um, I guess, yeah, this is a, a, a topic very close to my heart. So um, not only did we have to build a platform, we also had to kind of hire and build a team. Um, and that takes time. Um, number one, trying to find kind of the right kind of character to come into an environment where everything is very, very new um, to the organization, um, but also not new to yourself. So team culture is a huge part of kind of uh, my modus operandi and I pride myself on kind of developing teams that have very high levels of psychological safety, you know, enable them to fail, uh, enable them to make mistakes. Um, our kind of key message is it's like it's not ER, you know, you're not in an operating room, you are, you are able to try new things, make mistakes, as long as we have the infrastructure and the partners to fix it, then all good. And I guess the real point is here is just that if you want to do this, you're going to need to get skills that weren't in the organization before, as the slide says. So you need people to understand usability. You need people to understand kind of uh, data governance, data science, um, project management, um, agile coaches. There's a, there's a myriad of things that you probably aren't doing at the moment that you need to start doing. And the best thing to do is to start them rather than panic about not doing them so but yeah that is that's another key lesson that we took away okay lesson number three don't underestimate how hard this stuff is um there is a lot of complexity that is uh hidden you know inside this this last mile delivery if you will of the of the content into the you know the browsers of the of the consumers uh, there is a ton of uh, effort to make sure that all of your business models, you know, are being supported, you know, accurately. That you're being compliant with all the accessibility, you know, uh, standards that you wish to. Um, that you are, you know, not uh, uh, taking into, you are taking into account all of the things upstream, you know, that 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 could happen, that could create an outcome on your site. Uh, there are things that we find, you know, all the time that were just unexpected uh, in terms of wow, we never factored we never believed that we would have to deal with a situation where you know for example the entire subject hierarchy which is automatically compiled suddenly got re 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 reworked uh by an upstream process you know from from the the content platform but then that that those new subject codes end up showing up on the site or you know a hundred things like that it is quite a, a complicated thing there are things that get uncovered as you go along that will um, impact what it is you are uh, able to deliver and, and the speed at which you can you can move. And you will constantly be making um, trade-offs about sacrificing your nice-to-haves and things that you, you really wished you could get in order to really make sure that you get uh, what you need to get for all the, the requirements that absolutely must be fulfilled. And in doing all of that, all those trade-offs, you will not win any popularity awards. No, no. Um... And I guess um, the unpopularity continues because effectively what you're doing is, is trying to set expectations uh, when you don't really know what you're going to walk into. So um, the scope of work that you start with and the scope of work in which you finish will be different. Um, how long it takes you, how long it think, how long it, you think it's going to take versus how long it actually takes will change. Um, how long much you think it costs um, will be one thing and then the reality will be another. And I, just as a, a caveat to that, if you are migrating to the cloud and trying to work out, you know, your hosting costs for your first year, you will get it wrong because it's impossible to predict what's going to happen. And then you also have kind of uncertainty around requirements. So you, if you get a bunch of stakeholders in the room and they're unable to compromise or concede and get to a place where you know what you're going to build, then it's very hard to manage expectations. So the requirements of what you start off with and what you finish with will also be different. Um, so trying to manage expectations when you don't necessarily know what you're going to find in two weeks' time is definitely, definitely a struggle, without doubt. And as a result, uh, probably your best mitigation strategy for dealing with all of this uncertainty is constant and frequent you know, communication. And this happens both at the managerial level where 
uh, expectations need to be set about you know deliverables and 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 time frames of you know when things will happen. You know, there's people planning marketing campaigns based on these estimates. So uh, it's important to make sure that you are aligned at the at the senior level, especially if you're going to overrun your budget, you know, by a significant amount. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of just operational, you know, uh, uh, impacts about what it is that's happening and how how things change that that have impacts on other operational, you know, uh, teams. And so, at the operation level, people need to understand what features aren't going to be there that thought were going to be there or going to work differently than was originally planned. Uh, what does that mean for everyone else who's producing material or, or distributing material to third parties uh, around your organization? Uh, constant communication will, you know, help you deal with the uncertainty. Yeah, and I think the other thing is is, is that how do I put this? Is it's Agile is a state, is, is, a, is a mind state. You have to kind of weirdly like problems. Um, so you have to kind of get a balance between um, being fast, fixing things and communicating stuff to, to Brian's point. But also it is, yeah, it is the antithesis of how publishing basically works. So um, publishers predominantly don't, own and master their own technology or data. Um, and they definitely aren't synonymous with building their own software. So the adopting kind of the, the agile mind state and then subsequently the work for a traditional publisher that has always kind of either outsourced technology or considered itself its product to be a book or journal or another printed or um, electronic version of that of that product it's very difficult it's very very difficult and i think um sometimes you you, you can't expect everyone to get it and so you have to have a robustness to kind of keep doing what you're doing because that will pay out in the end but it's very very difficult for adopting agile within the business and we've talked we talked a lot about agile because um Software development is an intellectual, you know, exercise. Uh, you're creating intellectual property, and that intellectual property is improved by having multiple perspectives working together, each bringing their contribution to the table. From UX to quality assurance engineering to, you know, I'm trying to think about how we're going to test these things to the the, uh, the customer perspective or the business or commercial, you know, perspective. Uh, to the technology perspective about, you know, where are our security, you know, lines that we're going to draw or, you know, what are our uh, requirements for uh, refactoring old work and, you know, spending time going back over things that we've already done to kind of uh, make sure that we, we put our, uh, our software in a maintainable state for the future. Um, all of those uh, processes, all that conversation yields the best outcome when all those perspectives get represented. And it's important to make sure that you create the, the, the correct environment inside your team, you know, to make sure that you foster that, that collaborative approach, uh, which, you know, like Scott said, you can, you can hire in for that. You can, you can uh, select for people who are dem demonstrably good at collaborating. But at some point, and this is my next slide, lesson number eight. Uh, sorry, uh, at some point, your technology team is going to have to interface with the rest of the business. And those interfaces are often the source of a lot of you know, friction when two teams are working in completely different styles. One team is worse, is, is used to um, not, not having any kind of certainty and you know, having variable timeframes. And one team is completely dependent on dates that they can you know, depend on in order to schedule their you know, external activity or, or something you know, along, those, along those lines. So figuring out how to bring your, your agile you know, uh, de software development team into the rest of the organization so that everybody can benefit. You know, not, it's not just agile happening in one place uh, is a key challenge. And yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've picked up on this, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean the, the irony of this is we're trying to sell the idea of digital transformation, but we're also being, to be honest, like this is really, really difficult really, really difficult. And it's, it's difficult for, for many reasons. Um, first of all, building a platform, doesn't matter for who it's for, is difficult because you have to think on a global scale. Um, you have multiple, multiple, multiple stakeholders, all of whom 
use the internet every day and conflate that into, I know what a website should be doing. And then um, from a technology perspective, we have a large portfolio of different products. So scaling what we do, prioritizing what we do, saying no to someone, and it may be having a small incremental financial impact, but long-term will pay off, is a very difficult thing to manage day in, day out. Um, so I guess the question is, is that the, the risk profile of not doing it versus uh, the, the, the risk of going on this journey. And from my perspective, that's a no-brainer. You, look, the, the industry has to do this. It's just, it's just, you, you can't not stop doing this. But the longer you leave it, the harder it gets, I guess. Yeah. Uh, on the flip side of that, absolutely correct, Scott. But on the flip side of that, what we are seeing is that if you can accomplish this to some degree, even in the, even in the base level, um, what you are doing is bringing capabilities into the organization that will help it deal with the digital challenges of the future. Uh, and you're putting your company in a good position for it to achieve its strategic objectives. And for a long time when IT and technology was really you know, a cost center and not a, not a profit center, um, I think that relationship about uh, using technology to help achieve business business outcomes is still got you know some some ways to go in many organizations to to reach that level of uh, collaboration and, and working together, but uh, ultimately in the in the future as the digital products and your digital you know capabilities really determine your ability to execute your strategy, being good at this stuff and having a strong infrastructure and a strong foundation you know in place for you to build upon. I think will become differentiators between success and failure at the at the company level, and that is the end of our our presentation. Uh, the lessons that, that we've uh, highlighted. Uh, there were a few people who asked questions on the Q and A, uh, so I'd like to just uh, uh, start by um, uh, responding to that. Uh, one one person asked a two part question. The first part is. Could you please uh, present your position regarding persuasive or addictive algorithms and how you intend to protect your users from these kinds of technologies? Mm. Well, on our site, it's very simple. Uh, we don't have anything like that. There are no habit forming mm. you know, uh, routines or behaviors. There are no um, echo chamber algorithms that attempt to you know, push you into a particular worldview or you know, mm. political discussion or, or anything like that. So uh, we, we are simply, not uh, uh, suitable for uh, some of those some of those uh, habits to uh, places to exist. Some of that technology to, to, to take root. Um, the second question is: that, uh, Are your engineers working closely with an ethics committee or similar? And it's a very interesting question. How does the engineering, you know, the, the building of this? And I would also put that responsibility on the people asking for the features, right? The people who are trying to achieve a particular outcome. How are they put in check in any way? Uh, one of the things that we've got in place, we, we do not have an ethics committee as such, but one of the things that we have now that didn't exist previously is we have UX represented by a dedicated functional leader, a UX uh, head, and uh, his responsibility, and takes it very seriously, uh, is to represent and champion the, the desires of the users. So whenever anything is happening on the site, um, he's actually got the, the, the final um, uh, deci decision power as to how that interface is designed and what it looks for. And he has multiple times had uh, discussions internally about, uh, yes, I understand you know, you'd like that for your publishing you know, objectives, but does a user want that? Does a user care about seeing the content organized in that way? You know, or does a user care about these things? So I, th I think we are uh, moving closer towards uh, making sure our users are protected by giving them a voice in our process. But uh, I'm sure there is more that we could do in terms of uh, having a, a, an ethics committee. Mm. We also, don't uh, do, we also, just as a side note, we don't really do much algorithmic machine learning, AI kind of stuff as yet either. So it's kind of, you know, if we, if we did start doing that at scale, we would approach this. Another question that came through, how has the digital uh -huh. transformation affected uh, the print book production processes and timelines? Now that is a very salient, germane, germane question. It is, it um, is. <laughs> Scott and I uh, uh -huh. are currently trying to move the definition of digital transformation past the boundaries of the content platform. 
So as you saw from Scott's presentation about it was necessary to create a, a repository, you know, to put all of our content together, something like that, you know, did not exist in a way that would help, you know, feed digital, uh, digital platforms. Uh, we are also now taking the next step of saying, okay, digital transformation has provided us a, a transformational you know, change in what we deliver to our end users in terms of their, their online product. What can it do for the rest of the process going further upstream? And we are just at the very earliest stages of trying to identify the, the areas of opportunity where we think digital transformation will really move the needle and then uh, seeing what it is we can do with software, with technology, uh, that might have a similar kind of impact of, you know, we could come back to Frankfurt next year and say, oh, 4.7 times better in the in the production process. I don't know, mm. it, might, it might take more than one year. I was going to say, it might, might be the year after, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that is a very salient question, and, and that's the next logical step for our efforts. Mm, definitely, 100%. Uh, are there any other questions? I'm not sure if it's uh, if, if it's open for people to unmute and, and ask questions themselves, or if you have to use the chat or uh, QA feature. Oh, hang on, there's another one here. We we would love this you know presentation to uh, oh, answer whatever it is that you need. Yeah, this more says that there's a there's a question here. Can you tell us more about what kind of tools your platform provides to the user, reader, highlight, bookmark, something else, and what format the content is currently served? Yeah, I can answer that. So um, that's a, again quite a salient question because um, I'd say our understanding of researchers and users is kind of very nascent. So we're that we're still at the very very start. So um, what we effectively see from the data is that um, the majority of people are using Google, Google Scholar, come get what they need, and then uh, they read, actually. They read for maybe kind of a minute, uh, and then I'm assuming that then qualifies um, the content, and then they subsequently then kind of download it. So it's, um, we've, we've, I think it, we're nearly up to 4 million kind of PDF downloads since we started, something like that. And that's, that's our predominant product um, on the platform. Um, in terms of tools for the platform itself, um, we, I guess the, the wider question is how do you engage the audience um, when most of them just want to read and download? And so, you know, we definitely thought about highlighting, um, bookmarking, saving, um, and frankly, we put it all on hold and we actually took a lot of that stuff out and actually spent more time on our infrastructure because we looked at the data and we just didn't know whether two months worth of work to build these things would pay off. Um, so we basically decided to strip that right back. Um, so that is effectively what we did. So we stripped the platform right back, but I would love to experiment with some, some highlighting bookmarking tools. We just haven't done that yet. So I hope that answers your, your question. Scott, you want to take the, the, the team size question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> this is going to test my knowledge of like how big the team is. <laughs> so I guess this, the team is, is, is twofold. So we basically, so we have a platform team, uh, which I think now is at 12 people, I think. But also the other thing to highlight is just that we also work very collegially with 67 Bricks. Um, so there's, we've been hiring people throughout the year. So there's been a knowledge transfer and training and uh, as well as deployments and everything else. So in total, in total, I would say the team is probably up to kind of more about 20. Um, and you, if you walked into a room, you wouldn't necessarily know who's 67 Bricks and who is De Gruyter. But um, we are scaling up um, our team considerably. Um, we've got UX uh, developers, front-end developers, visual designers. Um, as ever, if you were to ask my boss, the CEO, I'm always asking for more people. But there's always someone else that I need, but yeah. So the answer is about 12, but with six, seven bricks, around about the 20 mark. I've, I've also had the benefit of seeing this process at two different publishing houses. And I would definitely recommend to anybody who's thinking about embarking on this to bring somebody in to help you. Um, so at, at Springer, there was a technology consultancy that was brought in um, not only to, to kind of you know put bums in seats and make sure that we could get, get started as quickly as possible, uh, with you know high quality uh, engineers, but also to help us bring in the best practices about being agile, something that we would not have been able to really uh, 
uh, work through ourselves. We wouldn't be able to generate it, you know, a, a, ourselves. And I think 67 Bricks also played the same, a similar role um, inside De Gruyter. Not only did they bring, you know, technology expertise and competency, but they also brought um, publishing, you know, realm expertise and agile expertise that helped us create the conditions for our own team to, to kind of already walk in, walk into a, a high performing, you know, situation. So I've, I've seen this done twice now this way. And I think it would have been much harder without having the benefit of, of that uh, crutch to kind of you know, help you get started. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're getting the question. The questions are coming in thick and fast now. So how did you, how did you, how did you bring the management and the rest of the departments to change their mind state from, tr from tr traditional to startup? I come from tech and it's my main obstacle. So I think both Brian and I could probably answer this. So I guess the, if we, I think if, if, you've, if you've taken away from this presentation that everyone else, everyone at De Gruyter now knows, completely understands what we're doing and why that is not the case. That is not a criticism. Um, it's just, we've been doing this for two and a half years and De Gruyter has been doing broadly what it's been doing for about 270 years. So, you know, I, should, I guess that there, are, that there, are, there are two points to this. So first of all, um, the credit to De Gruyter is, is that they didn't, they just trusted me to get on with it. It's probably the best way to describe it. And then over time has proved that what I'm doing makes sense. So there are two types of change. You either ask for permission or you ask for forgiveness. And so uh, sometimes you do have to make decisions which are unpopular um, um, and annoy people, but you're doing it not because it's, a political ego play or whatever you're doing it because you've looked at the data and you know it's the right thing to do um so i think th that's the first thing i think the second point also is, is that we there is a change is happening at de Gruyter. so week in week out things are getting kind of smoother better more 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 aligned but you know this process was relatively disruptive and maybe it had to be to get to where we are now so um so it's a mixture of trust and getting and enabling myself and six seven bricks and others just to get on with it and, and be a bit of a bad cop for a bit to get to a point where it, we knew it was going to work. Yeah, I can only echo what Scott said. And also to say, I mean, if you were trying to do this in your own organization, uh, I think there is a lot of um, convincing you know, that needs to happen at the senior level. But even if you get that, even after that, that, that buy-in about, okay, maybe this, this, this style of working, you know, can help us and maybe we can collaborate a bit more effectively, you know, on, on building digital products. There are still a ton of traditional processes that have never really been optimized for working collaboratively or working in an agile, you know, uh, fashion. And so there is just a lot of discovery about how do you do agile marketing? How do you do, you know, agile production? You know, and, 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 and how do you apply the lessons, you know, from this realm together? I've also seen that there's sometimes a lot of enthusiasm by some, you know, members uh, of other departments, uh, that, which then kind of gets uh, wasted when there isn't an ability to really follow through. So I think you setting expectations correctly, you know, about uh, how much can you change and at what rate, you know, what, uh, what level of investment is required, you know, to get there. Uh, will maybe help preserve your your long term success uh, by keeping that interest, so that people don't get frustrated and say, "Well, I wanted to, but there was just no way." You know, we weren't able to do it for you know a long a long period of time. It is it is not a, a rapid a rapid change, unfortunately. Absolutely. Not. We have a question here, which is, um, when did you when did you decide you need your own platform? Who exactly did decide? And you know, good question. Where did you get the money from? So uh, I uh, knew that they needed a new platform before I signed the contracts, pretty much, because I'd been I'd been nosy and sniffing around. So, but in terms of um, in terms of the, the process for that, I think I was about three or four months in, and then basically worked with the board on a presentation, and then just effectively told them that they had no real choice based because of X, Y, and Z. Um, so that was a collective decision, really, from the management team. Um, and the budget, um, the budget comes from um, we're investing, so you know we're profitable, so we're able to kind of take our profits and use them wisely. So. Um,
But and, and that, yeah. that decision also went all the way up to the owners, right, Scott? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly that. So I worked very closely with the family, uh, with the with the the, the 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 family board as well as the management team board. So, um, and they they get and see exactly the same thing. So, um, this was you know we had to get at least buy in at the, at the top of the business, which was you know that was I to be honest with you that wasn't really a problem. Uh, we have a, a very good working relationship. I think the like we've been talking about the the the, the pro when the wheels hit the road and you have to start making decisions that's when things get a little bit more fruity um but yeah um but effectively it's a technology it's a technology stroke platform decision so that's where the decision came from okay uh i don't see any more questions in the q a uh in the q a thing so last opportunity for anyone who'd like to uh, ask Scott or myself a question. Yeah. There was one question about audio books that I did not quite understand. So if anyone would like to rephrase that or, or ask that differently, oh, yeah. uh, audio, audio books is not a format that we really produce. Um, I think there are definitely some cases where it might be really uh, useful, but for the, the vast majority of our uh, kind of academic uh, you know, work, I just think the, the 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 main mode of consumption for it is is reading a nicely formatted you know PDF PDF file. Uh, I think it's quite quite difficult to get people to shift their their uh, consumption patterns from that. Okay, well I think oh, then Scott and I should say thank you. Yeah. Oh, hang on. There's um there's some more questions. Typically. Are we going to have access to the recording? I assume so. <laughs> I'll, ju I'll just say yes, and then make it someone else's problem. Yes, yes, yes. Is, are, are there skeleton platform that can be bought and customized? Uh, well, yeah, it, it, I guess. I mean, that's a that's a big question, but um, I guess it all depends on what it is you're trying to build. Uh, so. Um, you can build things quite quickly in the cloud, but if you want to do it properly at some point, you're, you're going to have to um, scale up, but yeah. it's possible. I, I would take a slightly more conservative approach on that question to say, I think that you are more likely to end up in a position that is uh, harmful or, or difficult than, than, it, than it to help by trying to use something as like a foundation and then build, you know, off of it. Um, I've seen this every time anyone has ever tried to use WordPress to, to fit into some kind of business need. Um, it, it takes you so far, and then you have to customize it a lot to actually get what you really what you really want. And then all of that future customization is made more difficult by the fact that it's WordPress, you know, uh, underneath. Uh, and even if there are maybe some open source um, uh, uh, options, like for example, I know that. Uh, uh, Public Library of Science, I think in San Francisco, you know, uh, open source a lot of their the software for their team. Like what you are effectively doing is um, locking yourself into other people's technology choices. Uh, and maybe there is some, some shortcut, you know, in that, but um, I, I, I would be very cautious about the expected benefit of, uh, of, of using a, some kind of off the shelf that then gets, then gets customized. That was a good question. I'm glad we waited for that. Yeah. I think that's. Oh, Scott, we didn't put our email addresses up there. Sadly, uh, yeah. people have no way, no way of contacting us. <laughs> yeah, we're on LinkedIn. Come and say hello. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for, for having us. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we hope that you found uh, some or all of this uh, useful and I uh, we'll hope the rest of your show goes well. <laughs>